Welcome to this lecture in Philosophy 100, Introduction to Philosophy. The title of this lecture is, uh, uh, well, Progress and Timeline, uh, which is what I've called it because that's what it will cover. It will cover some notion of what philosophical progress is and also give you a timeline. Uh, it, this particular point in the course, uh, we're just starting this at the, the very beginning section of it. Uh, this is the point where we're going to give you a bit of the big picture of what philosophy is all about, what it's, uh, what it's like, before diving into specific philosophical topics. And so this particular lecture does a couple of things. Uh, the first thing it does is talk about uh, philosophical progress uh, and, and some notes about the philosophical methods so that uh, you know what we're doing, so that you can uh, expect some of that and you'll know why we're doing what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Uh, and also, uh, some, uh, I'm going to present a little bit of a historical context about philosophy itself, um, or, or rather very little bit, uh, just because it does tend to help. So the first thing I'd like to talk about are some notes about the philosophical method. Um, uh, specifically, uh, this will contain some things that I have said before and some things that I, of course, haven't, uh, because we're going to need to know what actually counts as, as progress uh, if we're going to know uh, why we're doing what we're doing. And so one thing that I have said before briefly, but I can, uh, I'll expound on it a little bit here, uh, is the notion of philosophy as a critical field. Okay? Uh, so a lot of times when you see the word critical, you think uh, in terms of criticism, right? Uh, critical might be in terms of importance, right? That's not how I mean the term. Uh, I mean critical in the sense uh, that we get the word criticism from, right? So it's a critical field in the sense that it, it consists of criticism. Um, and you think you hear yourself, well, that sounds mean. Well, it does sound mean, but it's not mean-spirited, right? The entire point is that we, we all want to be right. Um, and uh, the first step in, in, in being right is, is not being wrong. And so the first thing that people do when they come up with an idea in philosophy is to say, okay, now everyone else's job is to say, what's wrong with it? Right? And, and uh, the idea is if we find things that are wrong with it, well, then it tells us what we need to change, what we need to fix. Um, and that's, uh, that's how we primarily approach philosophical topics, is from a critical point of view. Again, not because we're mean, but because that's just how to learn. That's just how to improve things. And so one of the one one feature that uh, that comes out of philosophy being a critical field is that, uh, unlike most fields of study, philosophy does not have a set body of knowledge that is essential to it. There is no uh, set, uh, uh, you know, belief belief set, or there's no procedure or anything like that that just is philosophy. Uh, there's no set of writings that is philosophy all by itself. Um, that's uh, just not how it works. Most other fields have this. Uh, philosophy does not. Uh, and again, that's because philosophy is critical. The idea is that uh, philosophy isn't a set of things that we know. Uh, it's a set of procedures for um, improving what we kind of think, right? That's a, a better way of putting it. And uh, philosophers are critical, right, not only of, of answers. So any, uh, any field that's sort of dominated by questions like ph philosophy is, is going to be very critical of the answers that, that we provide to these questions. But we're also even critical of the questions themselves. Uh, we're even critical of the criticism of, of all of these things. Uh, it, never, it never really stops. Uh, but that's, uh, again, that's the whole point. Uh, so a couple of examples of this notion of being critical, not only of the answers, but of the questions themselves, um, come from, uh, so for example, one of the things that, that oftentimes people do when they have to engage in small talk, so for example, if you sit next to somebody on an airplane, you're basically all up in their personal space and, by, and, and they, they and yours. Um, and the, there are a couple of socially acceptable ways to deal with that situation. One of them is to make small talk. The other is to put in earbuds and pretend the other person doesn't exist. That's, that's, those are both socially acceptable alternatives in our particular time. Um, but in any situation where you are sort of forced to make small talk with people, one of the most common questions they ask is, so what do you do, right? And, you know, uh, if that's me, then I say, oh, well, I'm a philosopher. Right? You know, a lot of people don't really know what that is. And so sometimes they'll just say, what's that, right? Um, that's, that's the easiest question to some extent. Uh, but a lot of other times they'll, they'll ask things uh, or, or say things that are somewhat more ridiculous. Um, the philosopher A.J. Ayer tells a story of when he told somebody he was a philosopher and they uh, sort of had a long pause and then they said, so what are some of your sayings? Right. You know, if he wrote fortune cookies or something like that. Um, one of the things that I'll sometimes get, I've gotten in the past is, you know, I say I'm a philosopher and somebody says, you know, oh, and they don't really know what to do with that. So there's a pause and, and I say, well, what's the meaning of life? Right. You know, like I'd tell them if I knew. Um, and so 
this is a, an example of, it's oftentimes the first example people think of, of a philosophical question or of the kind of thing that a philosopher would spend their time thinking about. But let's think about this question for a second. What is the, the meaning of life? Okay. Now think to yourself, what actually counts as an answer to that question? Not necessarily a good answer, right? But just an answer. Okay. And it can be sort of hard to come up with, right? That, you know, you might say a lot of things, but someone says, what does that have to do with the question? And, and, and it seems like that's always a fair question. Uh, say somebody read out the definition of the word life, you know, from the dictionary. I mean, does that answer the question? Well, no, that's not what somebody says when they, that's not what somebody means when they say, what is the meaning of life? Definition of the word life. Um, it's not, in fact, uh, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, uh, who we'll also mention later and, and also read later, uh, said that question is a lot like the question, is Saturday in bed, right? Um, it's a grammatical question. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not a very good question. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not really clear what the person is actually asking. Um, instead, the person who's asking that question is probably uh, wanting to hint at something like meaning or purpose. Um, and uh, it just isn't saying it very well. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, notion of, of uh, having to critique and, and make questions better is, uh, is a really good example of this in the humorist and science fiction writer Douglas Adams's work, um, and, you know, where he, he sort of jokes that the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is, is 42. But of course, that doesn't make any sense because, um, you know, we didn't have a real question to begin with, right? What is, in fact, the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? Only when we have that will the answer, 42, make any sense. Uh, and so that's a, a sort of a humorous example of, uh, of how important asking a good question is. And so if we'd return to what is the meaning of life, one of the things we can do is say something like, well, um, it seems to be a question about purpose, perhaps, uh, about what we're supposed to do when we get here. Uh, it, it, it perhaps implies um, the question, is one form of life better than another for a person to live? Is that the same for all people? Uh, or are there commonalities uh, that, that it would share for all people? And if so, what are they and how would we know? Now, notice that's a bunch of different questions, but they're all much more specific questions. They're all questions that you can actually imagine getting started on. Um, those are, that's that's uh, one of the clues that you have a better question is when it actually suggests some way that you could actually get started. Uh, that, that sort of seems to define a, a, a field. It sort of you know, sets out some territory that you can then uh, explore in something like a systematic way. And so that's going to be one of the things we'll end up doing is we'll end up ask, trying to ask a good question first off uh, before we're very concerned with trying to give a good answer. And so again, uh, something about philosophy that uh, that tends to, it, since it is dominated by questions, right, that's largely what we have in philosophy are questions, um, having not so very many answers, right, or, or continuing not to acknowledge that they're, you know, the answer or the right answer, things like that, uh, it, it, it can look like from the outside that philosophy is making no progress, that we're all just sitting here wasting our time. And I, I want to describe that this is this is an illusion. I want to describe why it's an illusion. I want to say, you know, I understand why it looks like, or it can look like, a lack of answers uh, uh, means no progress. But uh, what, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of redefine progress a little bit. Uh, the kind of progress that we're aiming for in philosophy is is not that kind. It's not the kind where questions will all of a sudden just go away uh, because we've we've done so well answering them. Um, first of all, they're not really that kind of question. Um, but, uh, but more than that, there, there are some, some other things that we really can do uh, with those kinds of questions uh, that really do count as progress. It's just that you have to sort of train yourself to look, look at it in that way. So first off, uh, clarification, making things clearer, is a kind of progress, right? Um, if you have, if you can talk about and think about um, and write about something much more easily and more effectively after uh, some philosophical exposure, well, then philosophy has done you some good. Um, so clarification is progress of a kind. So let me give you an example of what we mean by clarification. Uh, and so this particular example is, is, as far as I know, fictional, but it's a good example of, uh, of clarification and, and what kind of progress that can be and what, it, what that looks like. Um, the uh, American philosopher William James uh, is a 19th century philosopher who I think we'll mention later. Uh, has this sort of uh, story, uh, a little, a little, uh, you know, a, a little parable, if you will, uh, about uh, the role that clarification can play in certain kind of disputes. And so uh, he starts it out saying, just you know, imagine he was he was he was on a, a walk out in the country with some of his friends. Now, if you've ever been on a walk out of doors, you've probably seen a squirrel 
And something else you've seen is uh, how they tend to behave. Uh, if you walk toward a squirrel, they'll often you know, go toward a tree and then they'll climb about halfway up the trunk of the tree and then they'll put themselves on the other side of the trunk from you. And so then if you try and walk around the trunk of the tree, uh, the squirrel will sort of you know, keep edging itself over and stay on the opposite side of the tree from you. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, this is uh, one way that uh, helps keep you safe from predators. So um, imagine that this happens. And uh, uh, so, you know, some of James's friends witness this. They sort of, you know, walk around the tree and then, you know, the squirrel does what it does. And a couple of them uh, sort of get into, a, you know, a, a good natured dispute. You know, one of them says, so are you going around the squirrel or are you not? And, you know, some of the, uh, James's friends think you are going around the squirrel and some think you're not. Now, look, nobody really cares deeply about what the answer to that question is, uh, but James does give a good example of philosophical clarification. And so he said, you know, here, here's his contribution. He says, okay, so, so it depends what you mean by around, okay? So if by around you mean that you are first to the north of the squirrel, then to the east, then to the south, and then to the west of the squirrel, well, then yes, you are going around the squirrel. Right, but if what you mean by around is that you are in front of the squirrel and then to the right of the squirrel, then behind the squirrel, and then to the left of the squirrel, well, no, then you're not going around. And so, clarifying the various different answers in this way, or clarifying the definition, sort of dissolves the problem. Right, it clarifies the way people are thinking and talking to the point where you can see the the root of the disagreement. And as it turns out in this case. Uh, both usages of the word around seem reasonable. And so we haven't dissolved the conflict, notice, but, but by clarifying things, uh, we've, we've, we've in some sense made progress on it. Right? We, we've been able to explain why the conflict exists and why it persists. In other kinds of philosophical disputes, we'll clarify terms, and then we'll also argue that some usages are not as reasonable as others. In this case, they seem equally reasonable. And so that's one example, a good example, of, uh, of, of clarifying an issue, making it clearer to think about and talk about. And that's very distinctly uh, uh, part of uh, philosophy. What we do. Another thing we do that is, uh, is going to count as philosophical progress is that we, we're going to narrow the field of possible answers to some of these questions uh, by eliminating the, the answers that are very problematic. And of course, by more fully examining the better answers um, and, and, and that uh, will often count, that, they'll most often count as, as philosophical progress, right? Doing away with answers that really just aren't going to work. And then taking the ones that, that seem like they're, gonna, they're, they're more or less okay, and taking a closer look at those to see uh, if there's still something wrong with those, something we can fix, something we can modify, uh, if it can get still better. Um, and the, the, that's the major uh, area of progress in philosophy. Again, it doesn't necessarily uh, sound like like progress until you put it that way, but, but it is, it is progress. It doesn't narrow uh, the field. Because of the kinds of questions we're dealing with, that's sometimes the best you can expect. And here's another thing. Whenever a question does get some sort of clear and convincing answer, such that the question kind of goes away and, and doesn't really bother people very much anymore, um, or at least doesn't bother a whole, you know, enough people, uh, it tends to stop being a philosophical question, right? And so then all the questions that are still in philosophy, again, it gives the illusion that there's no progress. Um, but, uh, you know, say, for example, if, if a whole group of people decides that, you know, there's a pretty clear and convincing answer to a particular question, they all seem to be convinced of it. Uh, and then what they'll do is they'll go off and see where that leads them. They'll, they'll sort of you know, do their own thing. Oftentimes when this happens, uh, they're starting a new intellectual field, a new field of study. Um, and later when we start talking a little bit about uh, the, the history of philosophy, uh, we can see that that's happened over and over and over again, whereas you know, people have sort of split off of philosophy to start doing their own thing once they get a set of answers to a set of questions that they're pretty convinced of. And so again, from the outside, it might look like you know, all these questions that philosophy still has, uh, you know, are, they're just, you know, we're going nowhere or something like that, when, when really lots of interesting things are happening and some of the progress that is made in some of these other fields, like, for example, uh, physics or mathematics or some other, other, other branches, branches off of philosophy, um, in a sense, they trace their origins to philosophy. And so in a way that counts as philosophical progress. But uh, again, these fields are, are sort of on their way to split off. That's what happens to a question once it gets some sort of a clear and convincing answer, or at least when it's clear enough and convincing enough uh, to go on with. And finally, with these other fields uh, uh, where you know it's you know, progress is answers, right? 
Um, it's, it's possible, I think, to imagine those fields being done at some point. Like just to take one example, I mean, if uh, physics, you can imagine it being finished at some point. Like we, you know, whatever the laws of nature are, if we just know those, right, then the, the only thing that would be left is just gathering enough information in any given case to figure out what happened and why. Right, that would be a kind of completed physics. And then, of course, actual physicists would not really, you know, be doing any theoretical physics. It would all be practical, right? And uh, as a field of inquiry, it would, it would be done, right? And, and, you know, that would be that. Well, of course, there may be some really serious philosophical problems with imagining that. Um, but uh, now imagine philosophy getting to that point where, where it just, like, had no questions anymore. Right. So imagine somebody comes up to you and they give you this book. And it would, of course, have to be a very big book. They say, look, all of the answers to all of the questions are in here. And I think the first, the first, the first thing you'd probably do is ask a question, right? You'd say, are you sure? <laughs> right? Or well, why aren't there more? Um, or, or, you know, is that really all of them? You know, or what convinces you that this is all of them? Or, um, you know, you know, what convinces you that that's really possible? What, you know, why do you believe this? Um, and, and even if you do believe all that, you know, why aren't there more questions? You know, why are these the answers to those questions and not other answers, right? And of course, all of those would have to be in the book and, and, and that would start to get recursive and you'd start to have a, a you know, trans-infinite book. So um, I, I think it, it probably isn't possible to imagine philosophy being completed. And so as long as we have some of those questions that are, are very broad, they're very general, uh, they're very fundamental questions. Um, uh, they're questions that, that don't necessarily suggest a, 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 any sort of immediate notion of an answer, uh, but seem to sort of divide themselves up into smaller questions, the, the answers to which are going to be very difficult. I, I mean, it seems like we're always going to have such questions, and such questions have to live somewhere, and they live in philosophy. That's where they are. Uh, and so to, to that extent, we have to think of, of progress being somewhat different than just answering questions. That uh, maybe the maybe the most uh, simple and straightforward uh, way of thinking about progress, but it's not really, the, the, it's not the right way to think about progress in this case. So here, uh, what I'm gonna uh, next uh, embark upon is, uh, you, you see the, the title here, it says 15 minute history of Western philosophy. Well, that's a, a total lie. Uh, I put 15 minute history sort of more as a, um, oh, a, uh, a metaphor, I guess. It's not even a metaphor. It's just, a, 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 you know, when somebody says, oh, I'll give you a quick, you know, 15 minute tour. It does, it's not important that it be exactly 15 minutes, right? What they mean is fairly short. And this is a very short history of Western philosophy. I'm going to leave almost all of it out in this history. Um, and the reason I'm doing it at all is because uh, at least some historical context is useful. I, I've said before in the course that uh, the course is organized by topic, and that's because it, it's an introduction to philosophy course. It's not a history of philosophy course. But I feel like at least a little bit of historical context can be important and can be useful in helping you to, uh, you know, to understand what was going on in human history when some of this stuff was done, to understand who was writing what, you know, before or after or at the same time as whom. Uh, because again, I think it, it, uh, it does make at least something clearer. And the other reason to do at least a little bit of history of philosophy here um, is, is to answer the second of a couple of purposes that a formal education has. Um, one purpose that a formal education has is to, in fact, in, strengthen your mind, right? Make you better at things, uh, give you important knowledge that you'll, that you'll be able to make use of, uh, to develop important skills that you'll be able to make use of, right? To, you know, to, to improve yourself uh, in, in real tangible ways. That's you know, probably the main purpose of a, a formal education. But the other purpose of a formal education is also fairly practical. Uh, you know, throughout your life, you'll have to convince other educated people that you too are an educated person. Um, and just having the piece of paper doesn't always do that. There are things that educated people know. Um, and so uh, to sound right, educated, to, to be able to convince those, sometimes you have to know things that no one will ever necessarily pay you money for or that won't necessarily make your life any better. Uh, so for example, if you don't, if, you, if nobody will ever very likely pay you uh, to know that the first, you know, that the big three figures of ancient Greek philosophy are Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. But if, if you don't know that, uh, or have not heard of those people, or don't know their relationship to one another, um, then then educated people will not believe that you are also an educated person, right? So, um, with some of that in mind, uh, uh, here here we go.
So, like I just said, um, the first period we're going to take a look at is what we call the ancient period in philosophy. And, and of course, the big three figures in ancient philosophy are Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. In that order, right? Look at the if you look at the dates, um, uh, and uh, you'll also notice there's a little squiggly arrow thing. The squiggly arrow thing indicates uh, on this uh, on this timeline that uh, one figure is a student of the other. And I sort of do that all the way up to the 20th century, where there's just too much on the screen and I can't really uh, can't be bothered. Um, but you'll notice uh, over over on the upper left corner, you see this uh, the phrase pre-Socratic. Um, now Socrates is the first major figure of Western philosophy. Uh, and you know some of the details of his life. We covered that uh, when talking about the allegory of the cave, of which he, you know, he's a character in the, the, in the, the Republic, that book of Plato. Uh, Socrates is uh, sort of very much the beginning of our philosophical tradition in the West. And by the way, uh, the, this notion of Western philosophy, uh, is, yeah, yes, there's all kinds of things that are recognizably philosophical going on in lots of other traditions. Uh, but here you are, you're at a Western institution. My training is almost exclusively in the Western tradition. Um, and so, uh, yes, you know, there are other things going on, but this course does focus in Western philosophy. And, and we, I just acknowledge that, yes, there are other things. And, uh, but if we do focus on the Western tradition, which begins with Socrates. Now, of course, Socrates is not the only person doing things that, you know, resemble philosophy. He's not certainly the first person ever to do anything that resembles philosophy. There are people before him that had some similar ideas and approaches. Um, uh, he's not getting it all out of nowhere. Uh, and and those, those people, though, uh, they tend to be sort of less important to the whole story. Um, and uh, in general, we, we lump them together in, in the, uh, uh, the phrase called pre-Socratic, people who study the pre-Socratics. And it's, it's very interesting. Um, but after Socrates, of course, we get uh, this lineage, right? Uh, Plato is a direct student of Socrates, and uh, most of what we know about Socrates comes from Plato's writing. But Plato himself is much more than just a preserver of Socratic wisdom, right? Uh, he's much more than just somebody who recorded uh, some of Socrates' ideas. He's an important and extremely influential academic in his own right. Uh, his writings uh, have been tremendously influential throughout the entire history of Western civilization. Uh, his book, The Republic, extremely so. And um, in fact, uh, there's an awful lot that we trace uh, to Plato. Uh, one of the things that Plato did uh, after the death of Socrates was uh, uh, conduct a lot of studies. Uh, you know, he, he taught to people to be philosophical, to ask questions, to examine things in the way that Socrates did in that tradition. Uh, and the location that he set aside for, for these meetings um, uh, was uh, the, a grove of trees outside of Athens called you know, the Grove of Academos. Uh, Academos is a mythological uh, Athenian hero. Um, and uh, his, uh, that grove of trees was supposedly, right, his uh, burial place. And so it was, it was called the Grove of Academos. Uh, and because uh, Plato and all of his you know, students uh, met there for, for as long as they did, um, they started being referred to as the academy. And so our modern word academy and academic come from that. Uh, and so, our, again, our tradition goes all the way back to Plato. Uh, one of Plato's very uh, influential, probably the, the, certainly the biggest, most influential student of Plato, and there were many who went on to do some great things, uh, is uh, certainly Aristotle. Um, uh, it, it's difficult to imagine intellectual history in the West being what it is uh, without Aristotle. Uh, he's tremendously important to a tremendous number of different fields. And I just have written here that he's the discoverer of logic, uh, the methods of natural science, political science, artistic criticism, ethics, psychology, and, and, and lots of other fields. In fact, almost everything you can major in at a, at a modern college or university can trace its origins to something that Aristotle wrote. It's, uh, it's hard to overstate. One of the other things that Aristotle was famous for um, is uh, uh, he was the tutor of uh, Alexander the Great. Um, you, you might have heard of him. They made a movie about him a few years ago. I, I didn't see the movie. I don't know if it's any good or not. Um, my bet would be not, and not because I know anything about it, but just because, you know, um, well, so uh, as the American science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon put it, 90% um, of everything is crap. So um, that's uh, sometimes that's a general rule I apply perhaps erroneously. Maybe it's great. Somebody will tell me it's great, then I'll probably go watch it. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, Aristotle uh, is uh, 
uh, has some close ties uh, to uh, uh, Philip of Macedon, who is er uh, Alexander's father, which is how he came to be his tutor. And, and uh, uh, those political affiliations got him in trouble a little later in his life. Uh, and he was eventually sort of exiled from Athens. Uh, in fact, some people sort of snuck him out to prevent Athens from, uh, quote, sinning twice against philosophy, because of course we remember what happened uh, to Socrates, who was uh, sentenced to death by the Athenian assembly. So uh, the lives of, of some of these early philosophers are um, uh, not exactly easy. Uh, everybody hates moral philosophers. So um, after the uh, ancient Greek period, we have what's referred to as the ancient Roman period, someone after that. In fact, there are two big reasons why the Greek intellectual tradition was able to uh, spread as far as it did, um, and, and some big con contributions to the reason why it has so much influence even today. Uh, one of those is, of course, the uh, the conquests of Alexander the Great in, in uh, the ancient Near East. Uh, one of the things that that did was spread some of these Greek ideas far and wide. Uh, and of course, uh, another uh, entity that's responsible for that uh, in another direction is Rome. Um, Rome, which eventually came to dominate for a very long period of time, the entire Mediterranean, most of the north of Africa uh, and uh, Western Europe, uh, was very enamored of Greek intellectual life. In fact, for uh, the most of the uh, you know the Roman world, uh, being educated meant learning Greek and meant reading the works of the Greek masters and often meant going to school if you were wealthy enough in Greece or at the very least being tutored by somebody from Greece or who was trained in Greece. Right? It was a a very fruitful cultural exchange that lasted a very long time. And so some influential uh, figures of this sort of uh, Roman period of, of ancient philosophy for a little bit later than the, the ancient Greek period um, are uh, Cicero, a very important statesman and orator, uh, a very important writer. Uh, and he's responsible for much of the Latin philosophical vocabulary, he translated a lot of these great works into Latin where they could be read by some of his fellow Romans. Uh, he had, had a, a, a very important political career, uh, which came to an end when he was murdered by order of the second triumvirate of Rome. That was mostly a, a political. Um, Seneca is a, another important philosopher of this period, and I've left many out, but here are a few of the big ones. Um, he uh, wrote some plays that people still read today, and he was an important Stoic philosopher. Stoicism is one of these uh, schools of thought that comes out of the Greek tradition. It was very popular in the Roman world. Uh, and he was actually forced to commit suicide uh, by order of the Roman emperor Nero. Um, Epictetus, another prominent Stoic, um, he uh, was, was banished by uh, the Roman emperor Domitian. He died in exile of Rome uh, some years later. Um, it wasn't personal in this case. Uh, Domitian actually uh, 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 exiled, uh, banished all of the philosophers uh, from Rome. Uh, people who can think for themselves are often big trouble for uh, autocrats and tyrants, and, and Domitian was certainly one of those. Um, but as you see, like everybody hates the moral philosophers, and so... Um, their lives aren't that easy. Marcus Aurelius, the next one on the list, uh, does not uh, get uh, murdered or exiled by a Roman emperor uh, because he was a Roman emperor. So good for him. Uh, he was the last of what they call the five good emperors. Um, uh, one thing that they all had in common, they were all adopted. Right? They were all adopted by the previous emperor rather than being a natural child. And I feel like that may contribute to uh, uh, some of the um, some of the fact that they were they were so good, they were sort of chosen in some sense for merit rather than simply being handed everything. Um, in any case, uh, uh, Aurelius wrote a book called The Meditations, uh, which is a very reflective, very good work of philosophy that you can you can download, you can read anytime you want. Last on the list, we have uh, uh, Augustine of Hippo. Um, Hippo is a, a town, I, I believe, in northern Africa where he's from. Although uh, I'll have to admit that I, uh, the mental picture I get whenever I see Augustine of Hippo, I always think of a guy in a toga riding a hippopotamus. I, I can't help it. Uh, if you've heard of St. Augustine, that's the guy. Um, and so he's either the last major figure of antiquity, that is the ancient period, or he's the first major figure of the early Middle Ages, right? Uh, these these dates, like these divisions between different historical periods, are very fuzzy, right? I mean, and and uh, they're they're always retrospective. Uh, it's not like anybody at the time sort of woke up one morning and said, "Oh, thank God, the ancient period's over. That was ter that was terrible." Uh, hey, we're in the medieval period now. What a slog it's going to be until we get to the modern. Nobody did that. Uh, these these periods get their names many 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 years after they're all over. Uh, and in fact, we don't really know what era we're living in now. That's the job of some historian of the Lord here. From, uh, so um, in any case, that's uh, uh, that's where we are getting, getting towards the end of this period. Um, 
uh, right, right a little bit after that is a, a figure by the name of Boethius, who in some ways is the last of the real sort of classical philosophers, those, uh, the last who could really trace an intellectual lineage all the way back um, you know, to, to the ancient Greeks, right, the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, he wrote a very popular book called The Consolations of Philosophy, um, which is one of the most popular books of the entire Middle Ages. Uh, and of course, he was uh, imprisoned and executed by the king of Rome at the time, a man named Theodoric. Um, who Notice I said king of Rome, not emperor of Rome. Uh, most uh, historians uh, believe that the, the Roman Empire did not exist really anymore by this point, uh, certainly not in, not in the West anyway. Uh, other historians, like uh, say uh, James J. O'Donnell, for example, argues that Theodoric's reign was pretty continuous with the previous Roman reign. Uh, but, you know, there it is. You can you can read some of those things if you uh, really want to. Uh, James J. O'Donnell's book is called *The Ruin of the Roman Empire*. Uh, in any case, uh, what's next on the list is is a little controversial here. Um, and and so from roughly six to nine hundred, uh, much of the work of ancient philosophers is is lost to the Christian West. Uh, especially the works of Aristotle. Uh, they, they sort of disappear. And they don't get preserved. Um, they don't get widely discussed. Uh, and this is, this is the, the era that often gets called the Dark Ages. And I think that's a bit much. Um, certainly, in, uh, again, in, in the Christian West, there, there were absolutely interesting things that were going on. Um, they weren't, in a lot of ways, very strict continuations of... Um, uh, of, of the ancient Greek philosophical tradition. Some of the works of those ancient Greek masters were indeed lost. They weren't preserved effectively. Uh, and that's just a testament to just how hard it is to preserve things in a manuscript culture when you have to write out everything by hand. And especially when Latin is the major language of scholarship and not Greek, uh, as, as increasingly was the case uh, in these years. So, I mean, it's... Um, it, it, it's just it's just hard, and so to some extent, the the phrase the Dark Ages is owed more to the, the prejudices of later historians uh, than to some reality. But if we're looking at the, the the track of ancient philosophy and its influence all the way up to the present, uh, we do notice a waning of that influence in this period of time. In fact, uh, much of what we uh, have today in terms of the writings of Aristotle, a lot of the dialogues of Plato, and you know some of these other ancient works, uh, is um, has, was preserved by Islamic scholars um, and then reintroduced later to Europe in, uh, in the later Middle Ages. Uh, and we, so we can thank them for that, a uh, very big contribution to our modern life. And so uh, here we, we approach what, uh, what we call the late Middle Ages uh, or the late medieval period. Uh, and you'll see that uh, some of the, the figures here, uh, we have like Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, uh, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, uh, and, and those latter two have uh, sort of Latinized names. They were known to, to Westerners as uh, Avicenna or Averroes. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that they're, they're uh, uh, sort of Arabic or Islamic names. Uh, they're all figures, uh, and some of those, of course, you'll see uh, go into that 600 and 900 sort of Dark Ages business. Um, and this is a period of time that historians call the uh, the Islamic Golden Age, um, and it very much was that uh, in terms of you know intellectual and scientific and social uh, uh, you know progress. Uh, it was a it was a, a big, really important part of world history, uh, and certainly is important to our intellectual history because, as I said earlier, they preserved the writings of Aristotle and even expanded upon a lot of the ideas that Aristotle had been working on. Um, and uh, I, again, I can I. I'm saying very little about these, uh, all of these folks, and I'm leaving out so many, um, but, um, but that's just to give you a, a, a loose idea of what's going on at this time. Uh, in fact, uh, Avicenna is uh, still to this day considered a, a sort of a, um, a Persian uh, hero. Um, he's uh, on the money in Tajikistan. He's uh, on the 20 Samani note. He's one of the very few, if only philosophers, that I can see that beyond currency anywhere in the world. Um, again, everybody hates philosophers. So. Uh, uh, following right the reintroduction of of some of these ancient works, there's a great flowering of of intellectual and philosophical literature in in Western Europe again in the Christian West, um, uh, starting from uh, people like Saint Anselm onward. Uh, you know, Peter Abelard uh, is a noted scholastic. The scholastic groups of people who are very concerned largely with uh, applying Aristotle to new and interesting problems. Uh, and Abelard was also a very famous educational reformer. So a lot of what we think of as like the European university tradition, uh, some of which is continuous to this very day, uh, has to do with some of his uh, reforms and innovations. Uh, and then of course, in the late Middle Ages, we get a couple of major figures, uh, Albertus Magnus, uh, who's a sort of proto-empiricist, and he was also a scholastic. Uh, 
Uh, one of the things I like about Albertus Magnus is the name. Um, it's, it's, it's Latinized, so uh, Magnus in Latin means sort of great or grand or big or, you know, uh, something like that. Um, but, you know, Latin's a kind of ambiguous language in that way. So uh, you could translate it as Albert the Great, which is, I think, what it was intended, but I always think of him as Fat Albert, right? Albertus um, Magnus, Albert the Big, right? Anyway, that's uh, just my own uh, little giggle. Uh, a student of his, a very famous student, was uh, Thomas Aquinas. If you've heard of Saint Thomas Aquinas, that's the guy. And it's at this point that I should say something about what, what sets the Middle Ages apart uh, as their own sort of historical epoch from, from most of the rest of philosophy. Um, and in the Middle Ages, one of the things that uh, at least European philosophers were very concerned with was, uh, was Christianity, right? And uh, the kinds of questions that we now uh, consider important to theology, right? And to the life of the church and to sort of, you know, uh, the, uh, our place in the world as seen through the lens of uh, somebody who's uh, religiously committed, religiously devoted to the church. And of course, there was only one church at this point. It was uh, the, the Roman Catholic. So, you know, it's the, it's the biggest social force in all of, of Western Europe, um, you know, most of Europe generally. Um, it's, uh, you know, just about everybody who was educated was educated by and for the church. There were priests, they were monks, and their education was primarily supposed to serve, uh, you know, church life. And so that's one of the things that is very characteristic of, of, uh, uh, of philosophy in the Middle Ages. Uh, and that's why you see so many uh, saints in the Catholic tradition that are, uh, that are uh, sainted, you know, they're that are part of this philosophical tradition. That starts to change uh, at, at sort of toward the end of the, the Middle Ages, one of the things we can sort of point to as a hallmark of, of the difference between the Middle Ages and uh, the earlier and later periods. Of course, the ancient period largely predated uh, Christianity and certainly predated its, uh, its arrival as an important uh, uh, view. Um, and uh, of course, you know, the, the, after that, after the Middle Ages into the modern period, we start to see uh, less occupation, or we start to see religious concerns uh, split off from philosophy and, 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 and find their own home uh, in sort of theology and religious studies. And so that does bring us, in fact, to the early modern period. Uh, if we're going to point to one uh, singular event that we could we can say forms uh, something of a neat barrier between the late medieval and the early modern period, again these things are are pretty fuzzy. Uh, we can point to the invention of the movable type printing press, uh, which in Europe anyway was invented around 1440, and uh, we we say ourselves that we live in the information age, and that, that's probably right. I think that's, you know, some several hundred years from now, we probably will be located right at the beginning of the information revolution with, you know, computing technology, uh, the internet, things like that. All of the stuff that the internet has done for the uh, availability and the sharing of information, uh, the printing press did something very, very similar uh, when it was introduced. It made it exponentially easier uh, and cheaper to pr mass produce, to preserve uh, all kinds of readings and writings. And literacy generally, you know, goes through the roof uh, 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 eventually at, the, at this point. Uh, uh, the, the economies, you know, start to get specialized. We start doing a lot of specialized labor. And uh, ac academics, right, uh, academic subjects start to also become specialized. And this also happens in philosophy. It starts to really start, you know, lots of different areas start to move off away from each other. There are lots of different movements. And, um, and pools of thought and things like that, and, and other fields start to specialize and, and, and split off. Um, and, and it's all due to this tremendous flowering of, of information uh, that is now available thanks to, uh, thanks to printing and uh, thanks to the sort of literacy that goes along with the number of people who are reading all this stuff. And so you see uh, some movements uh, away from philosophy. So, for example, uh, Desiderius Erasmus is a very noted uh, humanist. Humanism was an important movement of the early modern period. Uh, and this is another thing that sort of uh, confuses students. The, the modern period uh, is, is between roughly 1500 and 1800, right? If you want to say 1440 to 1800, I, I won't argue too much with you. Um, and, and you think that's, that's a long time ago for modern. You think modern as being a lot more current. Well, philosophy is really old, right? So modern is, is about 1500 to 1800. Right? So uh, we're going to call the current era something else. Um, so, so this is the early modern period. Uh, and so people like Erasmus and uh, religious reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin, you've probably heard of, uh, they really start to take, uh, you know, sort of religious scholarship, religious studies, theology, sort of off into its own thing. Right? I mean, they start to specialize uh, in that, and that starts to become very distinct from mainstream philosophy, uh, much unlike the Middle Ages. 
um, uh, people like Giordano Bruno, Francis Bacon, uh, Galileo are, are associated, uh, along with many others, with the rise of what we call early modern science. Uh, that eventually will, will very slowly split away from philosophy. Uh, you know, uh, for a long time, it's, it's just philosophers. If you are serious about studying anything intellectually, you are a philosopher, right? And then the people who are really interested in the stuff that, like Bruno and Bacon and Galileo were in, interested in were, uh, you know, they started calling themselves natural philosophers, and then eventually that sort of, they split off, and, uh, and early modern science is born, and then of course science fragment, you know, many, many different subfields, you know, uh, geology and physics and astronomy and what have you. But all that starts in philosophy eventually, and never completely leaves, uh, but they do uh, sort of go off to do their own thing, they specialize to some extent. Uh, uh, later in the modern period, uh, we have people like Descartes, for example, who you know, did just about everything. Uh, he was a skeptic, a rationalist. Uh, he was the inventor of analytic geometry. Um, this is uh, sometimes also called Cartesian geometry uh, in his honor. Uh, it's the stuff you learned in high school with the X and Y coordinates and, you know, the, the, the slope intercept stuff and all that stuff. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's Cartesian geometry. And he invented that when he was about 17. Uh, we were dealing with a pretty high level genius here. Now, the modern period, what sort of sets it apart and makes it what it is, uh, is it's a, it's a period of really big ideas, right? Really important ideas that start to, you know, really contribute to lots of different areas of human life and human thought. Uh, and in fact, the reason we call this the modern period and, and why we refer to what we live in now as the modern world is because this is the world that was given to us by these folks. Uh, our world is substantially... Uh, the result of a lot of these really big ideas that first happened in this period and were argued for by some of these folks. Um, and, and, and we were very much, right, children of, of the modern period of the Enlightenment. Uh, just, just the idea that human life can, in fact, improve over time, that's an Enlightenment idea. Believe it or not, before that, there was really no notion of human progress. Right? There was very much an idea that, that human life was human life. It would always be a certain way. It would never get better. It would just, you know, might get a little different in one respect or another at one time or another, but it was not fundamentally going to change. Um, and all the way through the Enlightenment, we, we get devoted to this idea that not only can we change, we can change for the better. And in fact, it's inevitable, right? Once, uh, once, once reason is allowed to reign. Um, it's a very important idea. And I, to, to, I don't think I can exaggerate its importance. But all of these big ideas, you'll notice, uh, are, are still with us. Uh, we have really big ideas about the way government should be, the way society should be structured. We get uh, a lot of that is grounded in the work of Thomas Hobbes, John Locke. Um, we have ideas about all sorts of things uh, from, say, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz was a fairly important figure. He uh, uh, independently developed calculus along with Isaac Newton. Newton did it a few years earlier. Um, and uh, he's also a, a noted metaphysician. He contributed to a lot of uh, the uh, areas of philosophy, really advanced some of these big conversations. To some extent, we're still having today. Um, people like George Barclay and Francis Hutchinson are also uh, sort of important figures of this period. Other major uh, uh, sort of later mo modern thinkers uh, are, for example, David Hume, who we'll read several times in this uh, piece. Uh, he's uh, the, the, the brightest light of what's called the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, the whole collection of people that all, for, you know, coincidentally happen to be uh, uh, living in, in, in Scotland along with each other, talking together, working together. So along with Hume, you have to be like Thomas Reed uh, and Adam Smith, who uh, wrote a very important book called The Wealth of Nations that basically invented economics. So economics splits off from philosophy. So when you see these little arrows, uh, that this indicates you know, some things starting to split off of philosophy and then go off on their own. Uh, uh, also, uh, in the Scottish Enlightenment are people like James Watt, who is uh, the inventor of the steamship, and we uh, label our unit of power in his honor, so Watts are named after that guy. Um, uh, Immanuel Kant is, in a lot of ways, the, the last major figure of the modern period, uh, and he was major in a lot of ways. He contributed to pretty much every branch of philosophy, uh, and even some other things, uh, some other fields. Uh, and and uh, he died in 1804, and so it's pretty easy to just round off the modern period and say it ends at around 1800. Um, and now, at this point, you can sort of try and guess uh, what the next period in philosophy is going to be. I'll give you a clue. It's, uh, it, it, it occurs between 1800 and 1900. Okay, so you can pause the video now and see if you can guess uh, what, what that will be called, keeping in mind the philosophers are really good at naming things. So go ahead and pause. Okay, and let's see if you got it. So, uh, in fact, we call this period 19th century philosophy. 
um, because it happened uh, during the 19th century. Um, and the reason we don't give it a more creative name than that is because it's too recent, right? I mean, like, we don't know what era this is. And so we're just going to call it 19th century philosophy because it was in the 19th century. And then some historian a few hundred years from now will tell us what that, what that era was, you know, and, and that'll be that. We don't know. So um, this, again, this period starts to really, uh, you know, follow this notion of all these different movements in philosophy, all these different sort of specializations and lots of different people doing things lots of different ways. Um, uh, people like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill are making uh, sort of major uh, contributions to ethics at, at this time. If you take philosophy 203 ethics, you, you'll, you'll read a lot about those guys. Uh, uh, Soren Kierkegaard is probably the earliest figure of what becomes a, a major movement in philosophy called the existentialist movement. Other folks you could put uh, loosely into that movement are people like Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the Frenchman uh, Albert Camus, and uh, also Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, there were uh, several Americans, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, and John Dewey, uh, who uh, took a very distinctly American look at, at philosophical questions. Uh, we call those the American pragmatists, although, of course, they didn't agree with each other about everything, and, and in fact, sometimes disagreed about what pragmatism even was. Um, and, uh, but of course, their, their, their writings are distinctly American. Toward the end of the 19th century, uh, in analytic philosophy, we start to get a kind of revolution in mathematical logic, uh, owed, owed to figures like Augustus de Morgan, Gottlob Frege, Giuseppe Piano, and Alfred North Whitehead. And of course, th th those guys uh, really uh, set up for the crowning achievements of Bertrand Russell, who's really the first major figure of 20th century philosophy. And so I've given that away. The period that, that goes between 1900 and 2000, we call the 20th century because that's when it happened. You know, same same reason as before. And Russell really is uh, one of the major figures of the 20th century and the one first. Um, and uh, the, or the big revolution in mathematical logic is largely owed to what uh, Russell did in the very early 20th century, uh, building upon the work of those on the previous uh, slide. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein is uh, probably the most influential intellectual of the 20th century period, right? Uh, you know, you could probably make your, your, your arguments for a few other people, but uh, certainly I think a short list would have to have Wittgenstein on there. He influenced a great many fields in a great many really interesting ways, uh, not the least of which was philosophy. He made important contributions to logic, to the philosophy of mind, of language, religion, and ethics. Um, he inspired a, a, group, whole, a whole movement in philosophy uh, centered around a, a group of people called the Vienna Circle. Uh, that movement was called logical positivism, and it very much took over uh, analytic philosophy, uh, is English English speaking philosophy in the 20th century, very much took it over. Um, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was the most major uh, activity in, in all of Western philosophy for you know, a good part of the 20th century, especially the early, earlier part of the 20th century. And then Wittgenstein um, uh, refuted uh, the Vienna Circle and uh, logical positivism and uh, confined it as, as roughly to the scrap heap as, as any idea ever has been. So um, it's, it's a, a very interesting story. You can ask me about it at some point. This is a, a bit too long for this lecture. Uh, some uh, members of that, uh, that Vienna circle uh, were Otto Neurath, Rudolf Karnat, and A.J. Ayer. And then what I have down here is just a whole bunch of names. And I've left off more than I can even imagine uh, in, in you know, the 20th century. It's you know, still lots of interesting things going on. I will say this, though, if you're reading over some of these names, you'll notice some of them are on our reading list, which is why I've made sure to include them on this list here, so you can see sort of when they were writing. Um, but also, there's a number of names that, like, if you were asked, you know, if you were to play Family Feud and say, hey, name a philosopher, some of the, the names that people will come up with uh, aren't really on this, this list here, um, despite being also 20th century uh, philosophers. And, and, and I'll, I wanted to explain that a little bit. Um, the, uh, especially in the late 19th century and sort of through the, the 20th century uh, and you know, uh, until now, uh, there's something of a divide uh, between a couple of distinct philosophical traditions. Um, so uh, on the one hand, uh, you have uh, in, in Europe, so if, if you're in a, a French-speaking or German-speaking country and the philosophy is being done in French or German or another non-English uh, language uh, in Europe, it's very likely that it's part of what we call the continental tradition. Right, and and that's um, uh, that that a, lo a lot of other times is uh, there are a lot of posts there. So, for example, uh, post structuralism uh, uh, headed by people like um, uh, like uh, uh, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, and post modernism uh, people you might think of there are people like Martin Heidegger or Jacques Derrida or or uh, Michel Foucault. And again, a lot of these are sort of uh, Germans and uh, uh, French speaking persons. Um, 
uh, and and that's it's a it's a very different philosophical tradition. A lot of what these people are concerned with is sort of a, a, a reaction against and a questioning of some of the big ideas and basic assumptions of the modern period, hence the the, the phrase post modern. Um, but this is a, a very distinct uh, uh, sort of philosophical lineage, right? And, and uh, uh, continental philosophy generally doesn't have all that much to do with uh, sort of the other major uh, tradition uh, known as analytic philosophy, uh, which uh, sort of follows this path uh, through, you know, these uh, revolutions in logic and analysis and things like that. Um, and so a general rule of thumb, if you're in an English speaking country doing philosophy in English, you're more than likely uh, doing, uh, you're, you're more than likely in the analytic tradition rather than the continental tradition. Um, my own training is very strongly in the analytic tradition, um, and I've had a very uh, not as much to do uh, with the continental tradition uh, as 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 most philosophers trained in the United States or Canada or Australia or Britain, um, and unlike uh, philosophers that would be trained in uh, sort of a French or German speaking area. So just just so you know that there is that uh, bit of a, a of a divide right there. Uh, they're, they're, they're different traditions. And then, of course, uh, we got to now, all right? So uh, philosophy that's done more or less now, so there's a lot of overlap with 20th century here. Uh, we call that contemporary. We don't call it modern. Modern is, you know, 1500, 1800. So contemporary philosophy is sort of what's happening now. Um, and so you'll see that uh, this is a number of, uh, of people here. These people are just the people who are on the reading list. Who are uh, who are contemporaries? Uh, so contemporaries include people who are, are still living, mostly still working. Uh, Barry Stroud is retired, but he's a, you know he is he's 83 years old. He's still alive. Um, uh, Derek Parfit died just over a year ago, so he's still kind of a contemporary. He's been very recently dead. The, the rest of those folks are still alive. Um, some of them uh, still working, uh, etc. So um, it's. Uh, uh, I, I do want you to get the sense that uh, philosophy is not just one of those things that used to happen. Uh, it is a very long conversation, and it is a conversation and a set of conversations that go back an awful long way. Uh, and some of the stuff that was written, in fact, much of the stuff that was written a long time ago uh, is still valuable and relevant and can teach us things. Um, and of course, it has spurred us on to conversations, to progress of various kinds. Uh, to sort of you know line up various kinds of answers and and, and questions, new questions, um, and so you'll notice that when when you look at the reading list that there's people from kind of all over, although it does tend to skew a little bit more heavily toward the modern period, this period of these grand big ideas that are so important to the way that life is now, um, and there's a fair amount of contemporary uh, philosophers as well as philosophy from the 19th and 20th century, um, so. Um, the the again the reading list is uh, uh, is intentionally that way because uh, some of the some of the best stuff that's being written in philosophy is being written right now um, because it's able to build upon uh, some of the work that's been done before. So uh, the last thing I just want to mention uh, here at the end is a, a bit of a preview for uh, the next uh, lecture. The next the next lecture is about the notion of truth, and that will in fact be the first reading. Of our uh, of our uh, unit on epistemology, remember epistemological questions are those philosophical questions that concern knowledge or understanding. Um, knowledge is uh, going to be something we define as justified through belief, and so one of the first things we're going to want to do is examine some of those elements of knowledge. Uh, we're going to examine justification. We're going to examine belief to some some extent, uh, but uh, the first thing we're going to examine is the notion of truth. Uh, and some of those other related concepts like justification and like belief. And so the first thing we're going to do is going to try and get clear on some of those terms, what they mean, how they operate, uh, and that will be uh, covered in your next reading for the course, that reading that we'll take a look at for next time uh, called uh, uh, Truth and, and, and Related Concepts. So um, uh, do get on that. Remember, uh, there is a quiz over that reading, and uh, we will see you next time.